This lesson is about modes. And if modes confuse you, you're not alone. This is a very confusing subject for most guitar players, the vast majority of guitar players. And therefore, in the instructional world, it's not uncommon to see lessons on the modes. Things like, you know, everything you always wanted to know about modes. You know, they, they promise a lot. In fact, I even wrote one of those uh, for Guitar One magazine. It's in uh, the PDF download. I think it's called The Seven Modes of the Major Scale. And it makes an effort to show what they are and, and, and how they're used and so forth. The problem is that you go through this stuff and, and it'll show you, okay, this is a parent scale. We start with a major scale and then we're going to displace that scale. We start on the second note of that scale and we're going to play. And now we have a different uh, a mode of that scale and then the third one and the fourth one. And, and you look at all these different modes, each one essentially being a scale in its own right. And, and they have these weird names, these Greek names, which doesn't help anything. It just makes it seem that much more complex and all. But when you're all said and done with it, you go through, okay, I see what these are, and I see how they're created, and I can even play them on the guitar. And you're left thinking, wait a minute, I must be missing something, because I still don't really understand what, how they're used. What are these things? What are they for? And how do they relate to the music that I want to play? And you see, that's really the crux of it. Because until you make that connection, you don't really understand them. And this is really a problem about, uh, it's more fundamental than the modes. In other words, modes are music theory, basically. And until you understand how theory relates to music, you won't understand what the point of it is or how to use it. And then you don't really understand it. So all these lessons about modes will typically show how they're created, how they relate to each other, but they don't really show how it relates to music. And that's the problem. So really, we have a more fundamental problem to teach the modes, and that is the relationship between music theory and application and music. And we have to get that straight First, if you don't get that straight, then all the information you're going to learn about modes is still going to be useless. You're still going to be wondering, well, what's the point in all that? You know, and, and sometimes guitar players will go through and they'll, they'll learn the theory and then they'll come back to music and they'll say, yeah, it doesn't really matter. It, 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 you know, and, and at a limited level of application, you know, they're kind of right. But if you go further and really understand how theory connects to and relates to music, then the rest of the thing opens up and, and you really do understand them. So I need to back up a little bit and we need to talk about what a scale is and what music is and how scales relate to music. You have to understand that before we can even talk about what a mode is and how a mode relates to music. A scale is a collection of tones arranged in order, descending or ascending, you know, whatever order you want to arrange them in. But a scale is not music. A scale is a set of tones. And where do those tones come from? Well, they come from music. So we extract the possible notes out of music, and we arrange them, and now we have what we call a scale. And then we have what we call the root of the scale, which is our starting point, and we play up through the tones, and we have a structure which is the whole and half steps that create that, and we label the steps of the scale, et cetera, et cetera. But let's step back a minute, and let's talk about music. Does music actually use a scale? Well, not exactly. Music has what we call a key center and a key. And a key is related to a scale, but a key is not a scale, and a scale is not a key. These are different things. So, what's a key center? Well, the key center is the fundamental note that a piece of music seems to gravitate around. It's our starting point. It's our home base. And if you don't really understand key centers, you're not really going to understand keys, and then you're not going to understand scales, because it, it all comes back to key centers. So, what you really need here is some actual practical experience of playing a piece of music seeing what the key center is. The most common way to identify the key center is to listen to a piece of music, 
and then or play it. And at the end of that piece of music, if you're going to sustain a note that sounds like it's at rest, like the whole thing has come around and completed itself, you, that'll be the key center. It's the most restful note because it's returned home. If you play a song and you hang at the end on a note other than the key center, it'll leave a sense of unfinishedness to it, okay? And that's usually the easiest way. Now, most songs will end on the key center. Your basic big rock ending, you know, hits that tonic chord, which, which is a chord built on the key note, which is the key center. There's a lot of different names for the same thing. Key center, key note, tonic note, those are all the same thing. And tonic chord is the chord built on the key center. So it's also called the one chord. Anyway, so you got to understand key center first, and then the notes of a song will use certain pitches. And that is called the key of the song. So a key is a combination of the, the key note, the center note, and the type of scale that it uses, or the type of pattern of, of notes that it uses. I said scale. Well, that's kind of, sorry, I'm, I'm kind of uh, already starting to confuse these things. And I, what I really want to do here is pull them apart. So a, a song does not use a scale. It uses a key. Now, if we analyze the notes of the key, we pull them out of a key and we stack them up and we look at the, their pitches, now we have a the theoretical structure. Okay, now we call that a scale. And we put a note and we call the root of the scale the, the starting point. Well, the root in that case is analogous to the key center. So over here in music, you have a key center and you have the notes uh, that are available in that key. Over here, we're going to create a structure. Our key center is going to become a root and we're going to build up a, a structure of notes. So the root of a scale is analogous to the key center in a piece of music. But this is what's really important. The root does not create the key center. It's the other way around. The key center creates the root. So if you think you're using a certain pattern because that's a pattern that you learned and the root of the pattern you learned happens to be a certain note, you might think you're playing that scale in a piece of music. And you could be completely wrong because... Just because you think it's the root doesn't mean it is the root. It's the key center that determines the root. So in a piece of music, you have to be able to identify the right key center. You can't just play a pattern and think, well, the root of that pattern you know, is, is this note because the pattern does not create a key center. The key center creates the pattern. Now, why does that matter? Well, it matters because of what modes are. In other words, a mode means that we're going to change the root of a scale. So you take your what we call the parent scale. So you start with a scale, let's suppose C major. And then we play the notes of C major, but instead of playing them from C to C, now we're going to look at D as being a root. And we're going to play the notes of C major from D to D, and now we have what's called the D Dorian mode. It's the second mode of the major scale. And what's changed? Well, the only thing that changed was the root. So this is why it's important to understand what a root really is. A root isn't just something you pull out of thin air and say, you know what, I think I'm going to start on the second note of the scale. In actual application, the root is not determined by your melody. It is not determined by what you're playing. It's actually determined by the musical context. It's determined by the key center and the chord progression. So you might be thinking, I'm playing in C major, and it might work fine. Your ear will tell you, yeah, this is working. But in fact, if you're over a D chord, you're really not in C major. You're playing D Dorian, even if you don't know it. And this is what gets so confusing about the modes. So what I want to do is, first of all, I want you to understand that distinction and understand that when we're over here and we're talking about modes, when we're talking about music theory, we are not talking about application. We're talking about the, the theoretical structure of how modes are created and how they relate to each other. 
Then after we cover all that, we can come back and actually put it into practice and apply it in some real music. And then you're going to start to see how modes are actually used. But there are a couple of stages. And the first stage is to understand the groundwork, to understand what scales are and how they relate to actual music. Then we can come over here and we'll talk about theory. We'll talk about uh, modes and we're going to talk about them both relative and parallel perspectives. After we get all that done, then we're going to come back and take the final most important step is we're going to apply it in some real music and then we're going to see how it all works. So for the rest of this particular video, what I'm going to do is we're just going to look at the relative and the parallel perspective of modes. There's a lot of details and I want you to know that as you go through this, you don't have to memorize everything perfectly at this stage. In other words, um, if you think that you have to go through and absolutely memorize, you know, all of the structures of every mode, I mean, it, it's a good thing if you can. Okay, great. But, you know, what's really important is that you just get an overview of how it works and you, and you get some familiarity with the, the patterns the structures and the names, even if you don't have it all perfect, that's okay. Because in the final step, when we come back and actually apply it in real music, that's where it's going to become very clear and concrete. You know, it's, as long as we're in the land of theory, it's going to be kind of difficult to memorize. It's going to be like algebra and it's going to be abstract. And it's hard to learn things that are abstract. So we want to cover enough of the abstract so that you kind of get a feel for it to a degree. And then we're going to come back and make it concrete when we apply it in real music. So when you go to learn modes, the first step is we look at them from what's called a relative perspective. And what that means is we take a parent scale and we keep all the notes the same and we change our root note. And that's what creates the, the different modes. There are seven different modes because there are seven steps in the diatonic scale. And by the way, diatonic just means seven tones. So every octave you have, have seven notes. The standard major and minor scales are diatonic scales, and they both show up in, in the modal pattern. So if you know your major scale and your minor scale, really there's only five additional modes to learn. But the major and minor scale also have modal names that we use when we're in a modal context. So the first step is the major scale itself. That's our parent scale. So let's, let's do that. And we're going to do one octave. Starts here. So I'm starting here on my second finger, C, and I'm playing the major scale shape here. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. And the eighth note is the octave. It's the same note, uh, C, as the starting point, so it's also one. So typically we'd call it one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and then one again. And in reverse, one, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one. So there's the major scale, and we number the steps. Now to create the modes, we're going to displace the scale, meaning I'm going to take C off the bottom and I'm going to start on a different note. So I'm going to start on D, but I'm going to play the same notes of C major from D to D. So here we go. Now I can do it there. I'm in the same position. I don't want to do this though, because of course you can keep going that way. E you know, you can stay positional and, and go through them. But instead of that, I'm going to move up the neck, and you're going to see later why we're going to do this. But for now, move up to the second note of C major and play it with your second finger. And I want to play the same number of notes on each string. So before I played C major, I played two notes on the fifth string, and then three notes, and then three notes. I want to do the same thing, so we're going to keep the patterns mechanically following the sa a similar kind of pattern. So here we are. Those are the notes of C major from D to D in this position. Mm -hmm. 
and that is D Dorian. The third note of the C major scale is E here, and the C major notes here look like this. And the mode starting on the third note of the scale is E Phrygian. So the rest of part one continues. Of course, first we've got to complete the relative modes of C major. Then we're going to add the chords, which we're going to play as arpeggios harmonized to sevenths, also in C major. Then we relate the scale step with that arpeggio on each scale step and the mode on that scale step. And then we memorize the sequence of these chords or arpeggios and their associated modes. In part two, we're going to look at it from a new perspective. We're going to look at the modes from the parallel perspective. So we start each one from the same root, and now we look at the scale formulas. These are the numbers of the scale steps relative to the major scale steps. Major scale steps define the tones 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, and then we have variations off that for each mode. So we're going to relate the modes to one another on the parallel basis, and then we're going to classify the modes into major types and minor types. That completes the theoretical aspect of things. Then in part three, we're going to get real and we're going to apply the modes in a specific musical example. We're going to see how the chord progressions actually create the modes in melodies and runs and licks. So what we'll do is we'll start to superimpose the underlying chord progression, the chord shape, or more specifically the arpeggio, underneath our melody, and then we're going to be able to see the modes the modal patterns at work. And we'll also see how an awareness of the modes that we're actually playing can affect our note choices. And that's true whether you're going to play simple slow melodies or you want to pull those melodic principles into faster licks and runs. Finally, part four the bonus segment. Here we kind of recap it and take it all the way back to the beginning. We differentiate between pattern and key because all the patterns that we've learned as the modes, each pattern is each mode or all the patterns are all the modes. And this is where it gets so complicated. However, what's the difference? The difference is that the gravitation points change, the chord tones change. So we need to learn how to see the same patterns with different superimposed chord shapes. Here we'll also expand the modal patterns into our full three note per string shapes and then we memorize those. But we continue now by seeing each of those modal patterns as each mode. And how we do that is that we can orient our ear to the different roots so that we're not just playing the pattern, but when we play an example as C major, we can actually orient our ear to hear C as the root, and it'll actually sound like the major scale. We want to do that with each mode. And what that actually means is that we are differentiating between the modal patterns and the parent scale. Yes, they're all the same notes, but you use them differently, you look at them differently, they operate differently in music, and learning that difference is key to being able to play melodically, to understand how melody works, to understand how modes really work. You see, because understanding the modes, modes have their tentacles into everything. You can't fully understand the modes until you really understand how music works. So it, it, it gets pretty uh, in-depth here. And how we do it really boils down to the superimposing chords against the scales. So we're going to look at the caged chord form system. We're going to superimpose those chords over the different scale shapes. And finally, I explain how to move forward from this point to completely master the whole fretboard. I know it seems daunting. There's a lot of information, but there is a process. And if you just stick with the process, you will do it. So if all that sounds like something that you'd really like to learn and apply and know how it works on a practical basis, then join me on Patreon for the full four-part series. Actually, it's listed as a three-part series because when I originally started it, I had in mind to break it up into three parts. I recorded those three parts, but then I added the fourth part to really bring it back home and, and tie the whole thing up. And I think that adds 
an extra level. So it's four parts of a three-part series.